Well, uh, fantastic. It's great to be here with all of you here. I, I absolutely love that we're able to get together again uh, and actually be in person and meet in person. And I'm looking forward to talking to you, uh, many of you during the break uh, in our lunch breaks and at the end of the day. And for the thousands of you who I know are watching online, it's fantastic to have you here with us uh, for this session today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to move on. We're going to hear some more customer application uh, discussions with presentations from Steve Flinter from MasterCard and also Rodney Lassard from SLB. Uh, they've already been introduced. So uh, we'll get started on that session right now. So please join me in welcoming Steve Flinter back to the stage. Great, thank you very much, Murray. So uh, as, as Murray said and Alan said, uh, Steve Flinter, I work with MasterCard. I'm part of what's called MasterCard Foundry. Foundry is our R&D and, and innovation group uh, within MasterCard. So what I want to do over the, the course of the next 20 or so minutes is to give you a sense as to how MasterCard is approaching this area, how we work around new and emerging technologies, and we're also going to give you another demo of a different application that we're working on to show that uh, you know, the offer allocation demo we gave uh, at the start is, is one example, but only one. So first, a little bit about uh, MasterCard and MasterCard Foundry. So Foundry, as I said, is the innovation and R&D division within MasterCard. Um, and within Foundry, essentially, it's our role to help the organization kind of work its way through things like emerging technologies, how do we go about adopting those? What are the right use cases and applications? Who are the right partners, et cetera? And within the, the Foundry team, we have a broad range of different skill sets, different expertise that we bring to bear to help to solve some of those problems. Within R&D in particular, we're very interested in looking at emerging technologies and what technologies coming out of innovative startups, innovative companies like D-Wave, coming out of universities, which of those technologies are going to impact commerce, impact our customers, and, and ultimately the end consumers that we and, and our customers serve? So we're interested in areas, as you can see on the screen, like cybersecurity, DeFi, DAO, NFT, so some of the Web3 technologies, cloud-native platforms, and so forth. And we're helping to explore some of those technologies and understand where they fit within the overall commerce landscape. To look at quantum technology in particular, we look at quantum within kind of three areas that we're interested in. First is quantum computing, which uh, obviously is uh, very familiar to everybody in, in the, the, the group here and at the event. We're also interested in the security implications of, of quantum, both how quantum technology poses a threat as well as how do we address that threat potentially through quantum technology. And then finally, communications. What does the future adoption of quantum communications, what's that going to mean for our industry and, and our business? So just to break that down, on the compute side, we've heard Alan talk about the two different architectures or two different models, the annealing and the gate-based within MasterCard. We're certainly interested in both. Um, we believe that the quantum annealing will show near-term results and will be uh, closer to getting commercial advantage for MasterCard and for our customers. But we also see the gate-based approach will deliver longer-term commercial value, and, and we continue to track both approaches. On the security side, um, we all know, and anyone who reads the, the popular press around quantum technology, you know, the, the, the oft-used uh, example around uh, quantum is how it's going to break all our cryptographic systems. And, you know, there's, again, there's a lot of, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, to, to reuse Alan's phrase, around this. But nevertheless, we do know that the threat is real, and we need to be prepared for it. So part of the work that we do through my group and in collaboration with colleagues around the organization is to look at that, uh, that likelihood to try and understand the timelines and to prepare for that. So looking at things like post-quantum cryptography, uh, quantum key distribution, and, and other technologies around that. And also looking at how can uh, quantum technology help us to improve our security in different ways. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. Finally, we're tracking the whole area of quantum communications and how that's going to uh, feed into some of the other areas. Um, this at the moment, I would say, is one that we're watching, uh, understanding the landscape, <coughs> excuse me, uh, but not necessarily actively developing at the moment. 
Okay, so just maybe to expand then and to talk a little bit about some of the applications that we're interested in. Um, offer allocation, um, we described and, and showed the demo of earlier with, uh, with Alan. Uh, and essentially, this is a, a, a large optimization problem where, as we showed in the demo, we have potentially you know, a universe of hundreds of thousands, even millions of cardholders who receive offers. We have some cluster of offers that we want to give those cardholders, and we have to do an allocation or an assignment to figure out what is the right offer to give to the right customer at the right time. Uh, and ultimately, what we're trying to do through this program is to uh, deliver value both for the, you know, the, the banks, typically, who run these programs uh, in partnership with MasterCard, uh, for the population of merchants or retailers who provide and fund those offers to ensure that they get their offers out to the right customers, and ultimately to the consumer who receives those offers to ensure that they get offers that are relevant to them so that the, you know, they're, they're useful, they're not spam in their, uh, in their inbox or in, uh, in, in, their, uh, in their email. So this is a, a kind of a, a tricky problem, but if, if it's one that we get right, ultimately all parties in the ecosystem uh, can, can benefit from that. So, that's the kind of the, the goal of this offer allocation or offer assignment problem uh, that we're looking at. Another area that we've been exploring over the last uh, number of years is the idea of what we call hidden flow discovery. So this falls within the broad area of looking at anti-money laundering. Um, one of the areas that um, we understand that uh, crypto cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and, and others are used for uh, sometimes it's for money laundering. Bad actors are using some of the technologies there to try to hide the flow of funds across the network uh, and ultimately to hide you know, what, what may be ill-gotten gains. One of the particular technologies that are used there are what are called crypto tumblers or crypto mixers. These are services that are provided where you can uh, provide your uh, cryptogra cryptocurrency into those. The cryptocurrency will then be broken apart, mixed, integrated, uh, split again and ultimately will pop out the far end. So what we're showing you in the graphic here, the, uh, the mixing service goes on on the left. So we have some source of funds on the, on the right, uh, our on the left, some destination on the right, and the crypto mixer is there in the center to try and uh, obfuscate the flow of funds from one to the other. So if you're in law enforcement or if you're in financial crimes, if you have identified a wallet, a, a crypto wallet, that looks like it's being used for um, criminal purposes, you may want to trace back where the, that those funds originate from. And crypto mixers are designed to try and hide that information. Now this again turns out to be a, a large scale optimization problem. So with my team, we're exploring how do we go about characterizing that problem in, in a way that is relevant for the quantum annealer to see can we uh, come up with some higher probability to say this is the, the source of a particular um, target uh, wallet that may, uh, may appear that we think is you know, being used for money laundering or, or other, as I said, other um, kind of uh, illicit uh, activity. So this is that whole area, as I said, hidden flow discovery. And this is a relatively new uh, departure for us and, and early stage research that we're working on with the, the D-Wave team. Alan also mentioned in his introduction the idea of fraud detection. So um, fraud detection is a, is a huge problem. Um, we have very, very effective systems today uh, to solve this issue. Um, some of the stats that we were able to pull together is that MasterCard systems have saved already about $30 billion of fraud over the last uh, two years. But this is a kind of an evolving landscape and it's one that we don't want to sit on our laurels. Uh, it's one that we need to be continually revising, updating. One of the, the challenges within fraud is the idea of feature selection. So feature selection is where you have many, many different features that you could use to train a machine learning model, and you have to figure out, well, what are the right set of features that will give me the highest performing model? Uh, and in the case of our fraud detection, typically, given the, the kind of the real-time needs of systems like that, we have more features available to us than the models can use at any given time. So we need to make decisions around what are the right set of features to use. And again, this turns out to be an optimization problem. We can try lots of different combinations of features to see which of those features delivers the best possible machine learning model. So again, we're conducting some uh, activity and some research with the, uh, the D-Wave team, as well as our internal fraud detection team to try and identify what is that optimal set of features and can we help to train those models offline 
so that a model can run classically online. So we're looking at this as a combination of you know, an offline quantum driven or quantum supported activity and then uh, ultimately leading to an online real time classical solution. And, and those kinds of things are how we uh, imagine this, will, this area will play out for a lot of applications. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a high level tour of a few different applications that we're looking at. Now what I want to do is to pick one more and drill into it a little bit and again give you an, uh, another demo. So here I'm gonna talk about the idea of net settlement. Um, within the context of settlement, let me give you some stats around MasterCard and, and the kind of scale of the, um, of the network that we run. So um, as you can see on the slide here, we operate in 210 countries and territories. Uh, across 150 currencies. We have almost 3 billion MasterCards and MaestroCard uh, in, uh, in issuance around the world, uh, and we have uh, in excess of $6 trillion worth of uh, funds flowing over our, our networks. One of the challenges with all of that is that we need to be able to settle across uh, all of the different parties in a transaction. And, and settlement occurs in lots of different parts of our business, in our card flows, but also we have other forms of payment, other forms of <clears throat> excuse me, money movement that we're involved with that, uh, that we need to provide settlement services. So what do we mean by settlement? So settlement is the idea that, let's say if uh, bank one owes bank two uh, $10 million, if bank two owes bank one $9 million, typically those values are netted off against each other and only a million dollars flows. So this essentially is uh, an inbuilt optimization in the system to try and minimize the amount of currency that needs to, to flow around, uh, around the organization, around the network. Now, when you're doing that in a single currency, let's say USD or British pounds or euros, that's one thing. Um, it's, it's a complex problem, but it's, it's manageable. But as you move into uh, dealing with cross-border tra trade, cross-border transactions, and different currencies, it becomes a much, much more complex problem. And that's the one that we started to look at here. So the world from a payments point of view is moving towards this idea of real-time payments. So businesses, consumers, individuals want to get paid instantly. Uh, they don't want to wait for you know, two, three days for money to flow, particularly across borders. So one of the areas that we're exploring is this idea of real-time payments uh, at, done at an international level. And this creates a lot of challenges, but ultimately it will deliver a lot of benefits if we can deliver that. So, to give you an example of what we're talking about cross-border, we, uh, we'll need to be able to manage up to about 150 different currencies that are traded internationally. If we want to provide real-time payment services, we would potentially need to be able to settle those trades every five seconds, so you know, very close to real-time. Now, at the moment, typically when this happens, this settlement process happens, it goes through a single uh, point, a, a single currency, US dollars. So that means, for example, uh, I'm based in, in uh, Dublin, Ireland. I have a euro-denominated card. Uh, if I travel to the UK or to the US, uh, let's say the UK, typically that would mean that I would have to, uh, my, trans my transaction may be settled through US dollars on one side and dollars into British pounds on the other. So there's two trades there where maybe one might be more efficient. So this is the, uh, the problem that we're trying to, uh, to understand. So we've characterized this problem as uh, a transportation problem. So those of you who've studied optimization problems may be kind of very familiar with the idea of a transportation problem. But, but just to describe it here through the graphic on, on the slide, imagine we have a number of factories. Uh, they're providing goods, um, and each has a certain supply capacity. So we can see that the first factory can supply 20 goods in some given time frame. The second factory can supply 30. And then we have some demand for those goods. So we have merchants, let's say, who are looking for different numbers of a particular good. Uh, the first merchant here is looking for 15 products, the second 25, the third 10. And then we have a number of different ways in which those goods can be transferred or transported from the factories to the merchants. Uh, and those different transportation mechanisms may involve different costs, whether it's monetary costs in terms of the, the cost of, of uh, shipment or time or some other variable. And essentially, the transportation problem is to say, well, how do we minimize the total cost uh, of transportation of the goods from the supply side to the demand side 
while ensuring that we meet all of the, the various demands on the right-hand side. So, so that's kind of how transportation problems are, are set up. What we've done then in, in our settlement problem is essentially to take that formulation and to look at it, look at the currencies either as being supply or demand. So if we look at table one on the, the left-hand side, what we're showing here is that we have a mix of supply and demand of five different currencies. So Australian dollar is in demand, euros are in supply, pound sterling are in demand, and, and so forth. And, and this happens depending on you know, how kind of international travel, international trade is happening. As people move around the world, different currencies are in demand or in supply at different times. Or as trade is happening through non-carded flows, so business to business trade, you know, different currencies need to be supplied based on, on that underlying trade. And so what we're trying to do essentially is to get to a net zero position, to net off all of these trades and to ensure that the demand side can be met by the supply side. So we can sell the, the currency we have on the supply side, buy what, what is required on the demand side, and settle everything. That's basically the problem. Okay, so with all of that, I'm gonna switch over to a demo. So if we can uh, come over to the, uh, to the laptop, please. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and, and set up the problem. So in, uh, in our formulation here, we're gonna start with five currencies. Um, so let me go ahead, we're using simulated data for this, both on the, um, on the FX rates as well as on, on the data. So let me go ahead and generate a series of transactions for five currencies. So this graphic is now showing us that for the five currencies that we're using, uh, we have two that are um, in, uh, in, in demand and three that are in supply, so we need to essentially figure out how do we net all of those off against each other. So let me go ahead and, and click Solve. So again, similar to the previous demo that we showed, this is going to formulate this problem, submit it to the, uh, the D-Wave quantum annealer, uh, and we'll get a result back. What we're showing on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the slide here is that we have the, the classical solution, essentially, where everything would typically be traded through US dollars. And on the right-hand side, we're finding optimizations. We're finding a more optimal path uh, of the currencies that can flow without necessarily having to go through US dollars. The result values, those dollar values, again, this is simulated data. Don't take those values to mean anything in particular. But it, essentially, what we're trying to do is to find a, a monetary representation for how you know, the efficiency that we're gaining by, uh, by conducting our, our settlement in this particular way. Um, so you can see with a relatively small uh, set, we can, we can find small efficiencies. Now, this is not a terribly difficult problem and, and certainly could be easy, easily uh, solved classically. So let me go ahead and kind of increase the complexity. Let me roll up to uh, 10 currencies. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and generate, again, more data. Now we can see it's getting a little bit more complex. We have uh, different mixes of, of uh, demand and supply across the, uh, the 10 currencies that we're using. But let me go ahead and, and solve this again. Okay, so when we get our results back, again, we can see on the, the left, the, the traditional or classical solution where everything is moving through a single uh, currency, US dollars. Uh, and now our, our solution is getting much more complex on the right, where we have uh, different flows of currencies across, uh, uh, across different kind of currency pairs that are ultimately leading to that settlement. And, and we can see that the gap now is increasing between the classical result and the quantum result. So by optimizing across all of these different trades, we're getting to a point where we can, uh, we can really realize uh, some significant efficiencies across the whole lot. And let me maybe run this one more time uh, just to see where we stand. Let me bring it up to 20 currencies. So again, we're going to generate some synthetic data. Now it's becoming really complex. We have large scale supply and demand for euro and USD in, in this particular example. And then we have smaller sets of supply and demand for the other 20 currencies that were, uh, were chosen. So again, we're gonna go ahead and, and solve this problem and, and see the, the kind of results that we get. Uh, 
Uh, and you can see now, again, we have a relatively simple solution on the left where everything is traded through USD, uh, but the solution on the right is, is kind of unimaginably complex at this point. There is no way uh, we, we could be able to solve this problem in close to real time um, you know, in, in a way that uh, would, would allow all of these settlements to happen. Now, as we get closer and closer to the real problem, we would also have to bring in uh, issues around things like um, you know, what currencies can actually be traded against each other. There may not be liquidity to trade every possible currency pair, so constraints like that would have to be introduced into the, into the problem. There may be other uh, limitations uh, around different bid offer spreads, et cetera. So, so this is still, I would say, a simplification of the real problem, but it's, it's pretty close to what the real problem looks like here, and it's one where uh, we feel there's, there's great opportunities. The other piece of all of this is as we look forward to a world where um, we're not just dealing with fiat currencies, we're dealing with cryptocurrencies. And you know, there are now thousands, maybe tens of thousands of cryptocurrencies in the market. We're also going to have to deal with a world where um, you know, across different payment rails, all of these different payment flows will have to be integrated, will have to be settled uh, across each other. So we're not just dealing with ultimately the 150 or so currencies uh, that I mentioned on my slide, but potentially with thousands or tens of thousands of, uh, of currencies, a mix of fiat, uh, government-backed uh, cryptocurrencies and, and kind of regular cryptocurrencies. And when we get into that environment, we know that the classical approaches are not going to scale and we're going to need something like a quantum approach to give us the, the, the sort of settlement solutions that are going to be required for that kind of uh, environment. So with that, I hope you found that uh, useful. Um, hopefully it gave you some insight into MasterCard's approach to uh, quantum technology and the applications behind it. Um, and um, uh, I'll be around today and tomorrow, so very happy to chat with anyone during the breaks and, and take any questions you have. But thank you very much for your, your time and attention.